Uh, okay, cool. So um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the Rotoforce project. Probably not too many, if I'm being honest. Um, so what we're doing with the Rotoforge project is building an open source, open hardware, affordable 3D printer for metals, plastics, and ceramics on the home desktop, at least aspirationally. Uh, at the moment, we're mostly focused on printing metals and plastics using a method called friction extrusion, uh, which essentially uses very fast rubbing action against the surface of a wire or a plastic filament in order to produce the heat required to make the material flowable. Uh, so there are lots of ways you could go about doing this kind of operation. Um, in industry, it's known as uh, friction-assisted or friction-based solid-state additive manufacturing, which is a mouthful. Um, it, it basically is any situation where you aren't directly generating heat by using an electrical resistance heater or a laser to produce uh, a change in the viscosity of a material. So basically, you know, if you think about peanut butter or honey, if you heat those substances up, they become more flowable. Um, or like an FDM 3D printer, a plastic 3D printer. If you heat up plastic, it becomes more flowable. The same thing principally happens with any material at some temperature. Its stiffness, its viscosity decreases with heat typically. Uh, this property is also known as thixotropy when it depends on shear, in other words, on applied force. Uh, so some of the ways that this, this has typically been done in the literature are, or is, uh, you can either slide a rod through a rotating pin, and this pin stirs the end of the rod onto a surface in order to heat it up against something and deposit it, deposit whatever the material the rod is made of. Um, the simplest application has been taking a rod of a metal or a plastic and chucking it in the collet, the little bit that holds the tool uh, of a CNC machine, and spinning the rod and rubbing it across surfaces in order to deposit the end of the tool onto the surface as you drive around in tracks. And this, of course, consumes the rod. Um, eventually, you'll have to replace it or feed more rod through the hole. And there has been many studies on using powders because they're easier to consolidate and the energy barrier to getting them to solidify and getting them to flow is typically significantly lower because they have larger surface areas and uh, they're just generally more reactive. Uh, in the literature, people have tried all sorts of different ways of accomplishing these basic operations, uh, whether that's through direct application of a rod uh, onto a surface or feeding the rod through a die or a nozzle, basically a constriction of some description, and generating the frictional heat on the inside of the die so that the material flows through a hole of a controlled size, gives you better control of resolution in principle, um, and it allows you to use a non-consumable tool so you don't have to constantly replace the rod. Uh, some people have used a method uh, that's basically an, a, a development on top of additive friction stir welding, uh, which is when you take a pin and stab it through a plate and with enough force and, and rotation, uh, weld together materials. If you do that layer by layer, you can build up 3D objects. Uh, some people have used uh, essentially wheel extrusion. <laughs> it has other names. It's been called many different things historically. Um, but it, it essentially uses a wheel to generate a large amount of force due to friction on your feedstock, whatever that happens to be, whether a wire or a piece of plastic filament, and it forces it against a, an abutment, basically a stop at some point, which causes the material to suddenly change direction and flow out of a nozzle. And of course, there's uh, a technology that's been commercialized already at a large scale uh, called additive friction stir deposition, which is essentially, like I described earlier, just a hollow shoulder or a hollow pin and material gets fed down this pin, whether it's a powder or a wire, doesn't really matter. And as it flows down the pin to the area where the pin is touching the surface or very nearly touching the surface, this material gets extruded, gets stirred, heated and formed into solid metal or solid plastic on a surface. Of course, all these methods in the literature and in industry that have been commercialized or otherwise have one really key detail in common. They're big. They're very, very big. Uh, and of course, this is kind of a big problem. Uh, these techniques at such large size scales, we're, we're talking minimum line widths that they can print, whereas a normal 3D printer prints at like 
0.4 millimeter line widths. They're printing 10 millimeter, 20 millimeter wide tracks at the very smallest, often making parts that are measured in cubic meters of material uh, and emphasizing the ability to print very large parts uh, with relatively poor resolution and then going through after they've printed this near net shape and machining the surface down to give it its final tolerances, which is a big improvement when you consider that historically people have taken blocks of equivalent size and machined all of the material away, 95 plus percent of it to get the final part. You know, they're saving significant amount of material and a significant amount of waste at the industrial scale. But of course, for open science hardware, uh, you know, one of these machines costs a quarter million dollars or more. Even if you have grant funding, that's pretty much all of your grants. Um, so I'm, my, the emphasis of the Rotoforge project is solving the big problem, which is taking this, the basic physics, the fundamental principles behind this process, or behind this whole family of processes, and scaling them down to something that's more accessible, something that an individual in a resource-constrained environment, like a PhD student in a one-bedroom apartment, <laughs> can actually build and use. Um, so that's kind of the, the basic gist of what we're up to. Well, you know, what industry is building are these gigantic machines. And what we really need are things that fit on our desktops and can print with FDM-like resolution to make small electronic parts, find featured components for robotics or for scientific projects, um, structural elements for vehicles or machinery in general. Uh, these are just a few possible examples. So, the big problem with the big systems is generally that they operate on a fundamentally different set of assumptions. Uh, the basic physics are very similar, but because they're so large, they take advantage mostly of heat generated by plastic deformation. If you've ever bent a paperclip back and forth until it breaks and felt it and maybe burned yourself on the region that you were bending, you'll know that bending a metal or other hard material generates a significant amount of heat as the bonds in the bulk structure of the material break and reform. Uh, this also happens when you're forming large quantities of metal. And if the volume is large enough, that heat significantly reduces the strength of subsequent layers of the material that get fed into the heated region. Um, in bulk extrusion, people take advantage of this effect to reduce the overall force required to push a rod or a billet, a cylindrical section of material through a constriction, a die. And of course, at the small scale, there's wire drawing, which requires a pulling force to draw a billet or a wire through a similar constriction, but at a much smaller diameter. And these two processes are, at least in appearance, very similar, but the big difference is that the small scale process generally utilizes heat from sliding friction on the surfaces. That sliding friction term, the energy from metal sliding on metal or metal sliding on ceramic or whatever the die is made of, or plastic sliding on ceramic, generates the heat required to make the material flowable, to reduce its viscosity and allow it to pull through the constriction and change shape as it does so. Whereas in conventional extrusion or these other large scale processes, the twisting, the crushing, the sort of convergence of the material under a very large amount of pressure causes deformation. And this deformation generates heat, which feeds back into the process to reduce the force required to, to push the material through the constriction. And so since the frictional terms, since these small scale systems dominated by surface physics, surface effects, haven't really been thoroughly documented, haven't been thoroughly studied, at least in the manufacturing context. It's been probably two years now of steady work just trying to find the right set of materials, the right set of force conditions, the right set of speed and specific power required to get a metal wire, particularly of aluminum 6061 or aluminum 1100 or zinc metal to flow through a constriction reliably um, under these conditions and be soft enough when it flows through that constriction, when it comes out of the other side, to be depositable, to make it so that it will stick to something. Um, and so this may not mean a whole lot, but uh, it, you know, in extrusion, they have a different set of requirements. In these large scale processes, they generally appeal to a different set of physics, 
But for Rotoforge, our general set of physics is surprisingly similar to wire drawing, but with a few minor caveats. Uh, the first equation at the top of this slide is an equation describing the force required to push or pull a wire through a die of a certain cross-sectional area. So the first term is a constant that describes some geometric features of the die. Uh, sigma y is the flow stress or the yield stress of the material that you're trying to pull through the constriction or push through the constriction. So for aluminum, that's like about 260 megapascals at room temperature. A naught and A i are the initial area of the wire, basically its cross-section, circular cross-section, and the die area, which is its circular cross-section. Um, and then the last term is just the description of the angle of the entrance to the die, whether that's a 60 degree cone or a 90 degree flat or whatever that might be, um, whatever your choice is, it has an effect on the amount of force required to make the material flow through the hole because well, basically fluid mechanics dictates that the shape of the of the fluid, the shape of this material as it deforms through the hole changes, and that change in material has to conserve mass, and the specific way it changes shape changes how that mass is conserved. Um, the next equation is a, an equation for very basic description of how heat is generated by friction. F is for force, the applied normal force, basically the extruder force described in the first equation. V is the rotational velocity of the die and may be a multi-component velocity, including the speed with which the wire travels through the die, how fast the material is deforming through the die. And mu is the coefficient of friction, which varies widely depending on what kinds of materials you actually are using. And then delta T is how much heat in the mass of the wire is evolved at this speed, essentially. Basically, with or how much temperature, basically, how much the temperature changes of the wire, how much the temperature of the wire changes in response to the heat generated and the force applied. Of course, you know, we're, we're talking about, with Ferrota force, we're talking about working at scales smaller than five millimeters, really smaller than two. Our wire diameter is about 1.6 millimeters, and our orifice, our die diameter is about 1.4 millimeters, and could be as small as 0 0.8, 0 0.9 millimeters. So basically what happens is we have this rapidly spinning semi-conical die. Uh, a piece of wire feedstock is fed down into it under some force. As the force drives the wire into the rotating die, heat, as you can see by the red arrows here, is generated due to sliding friction because the die is rotating around a stationary wire. And each rotation generates additional dislocations at the surface, um, in addition to some plastic deformation. As the heat flows into the wire, the wire softens, and that makes it easier to flow through the constriction. And so subsequent sections of the wire flow down into this rotating orifice and get heated similarly. And this happens at probably four to nine millimeters per second of wire feed rate, and about 15,000, somewhere between 15,000 and 30,000 RPM of die rotation speed. And typical actual surface speeds are between 0.9 and 2 meters per second or so. Um, and of course, if you increase the wire feed rate, this principally increases the heat evolved. And something kind of counterintuitive about this that we've only recently figured out that's been kind of important is that if you push the wire faster, it doesn't actually increase the extruder force required to move the wire through the die as long as there are no chemical reactions between the die and the wire. And so in principle, you can keep a constant RPM. And as long as you keep this die spinning at the same speed, you can continuously increase the wire feed rate. And the temperature in the wire as it comes out of the hole should also increase. And this makes it easier to print. Of course, once the wire flows out of the hole and onto a substrate, it should flash or form something that looks a bit like a mushroom or a foot or a bullet. If it has been impacted against a plate or something of that nature, it makes this sort of flattened mushroom shape. The wire does essentially the same thing when it is softened and flowing out of the die. And as it flows under the flat tip of the outside of the die, it spreads and gets heated by rubbing from the outside of the die as well. And this facilitates chemical bonding with the surface underneath or sometimes mechanical bonding, depending on what it is. 
Uh, so we've tried this on Garolite with some success, which is the same stuff that circuit boards are made of, FR4 basically. Um, we tried it on aluminum oxide, aluminum nitride, quartz, and a few other substrates with good success uh, in bonding aluminum specifically to these substrates, and as well as some other, met some other metals, zinc, uh, soft metals, lead, tin alloys, like solder alloys, things like that. We're slowly working our way up to more interesting stuff like copper and stainless steel in order to do more structural applications. So this is a picture of us extruding 6061 aluminum uh, through one of our stainless steel dies. It's a very blurry microscope image because it's moving very fast and very there's a lot of vibration. Um, but you can see that the material is flowing through the hole um, and you can see some smoke from the lubricant we use to keep the wire uh, from rubbing against the insides of the hollow shaft of our brushless DC motor um, that's providing the rotation. Um, and it tends to smoke off of the wire surface whenever it comes out of the hole because the wire is over 300 degrees Celsius, um, probably more north of 400 degrees Celsius. At some point where aluminum essentially flows like peanut butter or Play-Doh is how hot it is. It's, it's hot enough to make aluminum flow like Play-Doh. That's <laughs> about the best way I know how to describe it. Um, and here is a, a clip from a video I posted on YouTube previously um, of us printing aluminum 1100, uh, about a 200 micron thick deposit of 1100 alloy aluminum onto FR4, basically a Garolite build plate. And this whole system is designed to fit on an Ender 3. It's essentially just a mod for an existing, a modification of an existing 3D printer frame that you could principally put on any 3D printer or any CNC machine. Uh, it, 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 it's really very simple. It essentially utilizes a brushless DC motor from a drone and a typical FDM extruder to push the wire. And it's mounted on some motion platform, whether that's a 3D printer frame that you built yourself out of all thread from a RepRap design or something you've bought off the shelf, like an Ender 3 or a Prusa. And so where we're at right now, uh, I mostly work on electronics. That's what I generally am focused on. So. I'm emphasizing printing two-dimensional and three-dimensional electronic packaging and electronic circuits using specifically aluminum, copper, zinc, lead, tin, metals on aluminum oxide, quartz, aluminum nitride, silicon nitride, and possibly diamond substrates, and as well as FR4 and Garolite. We're working towards printing freeform structural parts for applications like rocket engines, robotic parts, structural uh, you know, supports for automotive applications or anything else you might like. Um, and we've only just started to obtain repeatable extrusion in aluminum 6061, aluminum 1100, and ZMAC, which is a trade name for zinc. It's the type of material they use in like die casting. So like if you've ever seen a, a Hot Wheels or a Matchbox car uh, or like a, a George Foreman grill, those, those objects are made by zinc die casting typically. Um, and we're working towards building 3D parts. Those are hopefully coming soon, soon being maybe three months, maybe six. <laughs> we'll have to see. You never know with research. It, it's kind of a roll of the dice. Uh, you know, I, I said it would take me six months to figure it out initially, and it took me two years. So, you know, <laughs> hopefully maybe with some, some help from some other corners and some better advice and uh, maybe with our, our recent learnings, things will go a little faster. But it's potentially useful for all kinds of things. Uh, and something that's very exciting is that because it uses friction, it's essentially universal. Um, you can use plastics, you could use ceramics, you could use metals, and you and because friction is fundamentally limited by essentially the laws of physics at two surfaces and sliding contact, um, to producing temperatures no higher than the melting point of the material you're trying to print it conceivably makes possible on the home desktop, the ability to print heterogeneous materials or broadly different materials at the same time. So if you wanted to print metals on metals, so like stainless steel, high melting point, on aluminum, low melting point metals, you could because no fusion takes place. You don't actually have to heat the surface of the material you're sticking things to, to the temperature required to make your feedstock melt. And of course, if you're working with plastics and metals, being able to print metal directly onto plastics or plastics directly onto metals, it's unheard of. <laughs> no one does that. Um, or metals onto ceramics for that matter. The, the drastically differing thermal expansion rates of those materials uh, 
makes it very difficult to bond them under most circumstances. So I might have gone on a little too long when this may be a bit long winded. But uh, if you'd like to get involved or follow along, uh, I have a YouTube channel, a GitHub, a Discord, and a blog site that I update periodically. Uh, typically, YouTube and blog no more than once a month. Uh, I try to keep the documentation up to date on GitHub. And we do have a project website that is fairly outdated that I, I will update soon. Uh, our, most of our constructor project discussions occur on our Discord, so feel free to join anytime. Um, and you can send me a message if you want to invite or if you want further discussion. And I'm happy to field any questions. Thanks a lot for listening and uh, having me here. It's really nice to see other people working on open science hardware projects and, and being able to contribute a little bit in my own little way. <laughs>